It was the season of Lent in a small Roman Catholic neighborhood. And of course, that meant only fish dinners for quite a while. And that was for everyone except for Donald McGregor, who was a Presbyterian. Every Friday night, Mr. McGregor would fire up his grill and put on a nice mouth-watering steak. And the smell would permeate the entire neighborhood and make all the neighbors green with envy. So they got together with their parish priest, who agreed to talk to Mr. McGregor about this. And after a long, fairly persuasive conversation, Mr. McGregor, who was a pretty agreeable sort, agreed to convert to Roman Catholicism. The priest baptized him on the spot, sprinkling his head with holy water and saying to him, Donald McGregor, you were born a Presbyterian, you were raised a Presbyterian, but now you are Catholic. And everyone was quite happy until the next year on the very first Friday of Lent. Mr. McGregor fired up his grill again and the delicious smell of steak wafted through the neighborhood once more. Well, the neighbors rushed over to his house, peering over his fence, and they watched as Mr. McGregor bent over his grill and he held in his hand a small bowl of water and as he sprinkled water onto the sizzling steak, they could hear him say, you were born a cow, you were raised a cow, but now you are a fish. Today's sermon is about baptism, an ancient ritual that is very important to Presbyterians, to Roman Catholics, and pretty much all Christian denominations. Some Christians baptize only adults. Others baptize mostly infants. Some sprinkle with water. Others completely immerse. And entire wars have been fought over how to baptize someone in just the right way, at just the right time, with just the right words. I think Craig Field is going to address some of those differences in his sermon next Sunday. But today, I want to walk us back a bit and focus on something really basic, something that everyone pretty much seems to agree on, the water and the Spirit of God that is somehow present in the act of baptism. Now, I say that everyone pretty much agrees on that, but sometimes the things that we agree on are the things that we don't really think much about and forget why we do them. So how did water come to be seen as the central act of baptism? And how did this ritual, which for Presbyterians is one of only two sacraments that we practice, how did this ritual come into existence long before the Presbyterian Church existed, long before Christianity existed, long before even the time of Jesus, long ago in the ancient faith of the Jewish people. So to accomplish this, we're going to take a trip through the Hebrew Scriptures, which we often refer to as the Old Testament. And like all good stories, we are going to start at the very beginning. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. If you're following along in your pew Bibles, you can find that on page 1. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. Becky, I think I've got slides for the scripture passages you can throw up there, although the print is, yeah, pretty small. If you can read that you're doing good. I'm not sure which is smaller, the ones in your pew Bibles or the, the text on the screen. This is the first place that water is ever mentioned in the Bible, right there in verse 2. And even that early on, 
it's evident that water is somehow connected with God's spirit. The NRSV says that a wind from God swept over the face of the waters, but the Hebrew word for wind is ruach, which is the same word used throughout the scriptures for spirit, and particularly God's spirit. So this is God's spirit hovering over the face of the waters. And if you keep reading through the first chapter of Genesis, you'll find that the waters, along with the land, everything that grows on the land and in the water, the animals and all the people are created by God and blessed by God when he sees them and calls them good. Some people ask me if I use a special kind of water for baptisms, some kind of holy water that has been specially blessed. And as I walk with them over to the water faucet to pour the water into the baptismal bowl, I say, no. And that's because I don't think that I am capable of giving a better blessing than the one that God has already given to all the waters of the earth at the time of creation. Sometimes, though, if I'm feeling a little bit cantankerous and someone asks me how you make holy water, I tell them, you just take regular water and boil the hell out of it. Our story continues in the 17th chapter of Genesis. There is no water in this particular passage, but there's something else that shows up for the very first time in the scriptures, and that is a covenant, a promise, an agreement. Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 through 7. You can find this a few pages after Genesis 1 on page 13 in your pew Bibles. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, and Abram in Hebrew means exalted ancestor, but your name shall be Abraham, which means ancestor of nations. For I have made you an ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your offspring after you. If you keep reading in this chapter of Genesis, after this pact is made by God and by Abraham, there's an outward visible sign of the covenant. And at the time, that was circumcision. Now, obviously, it was only an outward sign for males, and hopefully it was not a very visible sign most of the time, but that was the idea that all who received this sign, all the male descendants of Abraham would be marked in this way from an early age, and it served as a reminder to them and to others of the promise that God had made, not just to Abraham, but to all of his descendants genealogical as well as spiritual. Now, eventually those descendants of Abraham grew into a culture, a people, a nation. And just like all groups of people, they experienced triumphs and tragedies, they experienced victories and setbacks. And in the midst of all of that up and down and back and forth, they often called into question or sometimes just forgot about the promise, the old promise, that God would be their God and they would be God's people. So God sent leaders to them and prophets to remind them and messengers to call them back into the covenant. And here, especially through one prophet, the prophet Isaiah, water comes back into the picture. This is Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 through 4. You can find that on page 672 of your Old Testaments. But now, thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, 
for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Sheba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. I give people in return for you, nations in exchange for your life. Now, many biblical scholars think that when Isaiah is talking about passing through the waters and walking through the fire, that this may represent some kind of ancient Middle Eastern rite of passage. For what it's worth, in all Middle Eastern cultures, both fire and water represent and are associated with God and God's spirit. But these things, fire and water, are also representative of danger and uncertainty. The same water that sustains us and nourishes us is the water of the floods that come and wipe out our homes and drown our families. The same fire that gives us warmth and light is also the fire that burns our homes and our fields and scorches the earth. And so I think the symbolism here is that God does not take away our trials and tribulations, the uncertainty and danger in our lives. What God does instead, evident here in this passage, God walks with us through those things. We still suffer pain in life. We still encounter danger and uncertainty. But God is ever present with us in both the water and in the fire. Rituals, whether in some cultures it's walking across burning coals or in our own culture, baptism. Rituals have the power to remind us of these things and to comfort us, especially when we are celebrating a life or a journey that is just beginning, a journey with all the hope, all the uncertainty, all the peril, and all the promise still ahead, still in the future. One more scripture passage. Oh, no, two more from Isaiah. This is Isaiah 44, 1 through 4. I think it's just one page past the previous one on page 673. But now hear, O Jacob, my servant, Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus says the Lord who made you, who formed you in the womb and will help you. Do not fear, O Jacob, my servant, Yeshurun, whom I have chosen, for I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your descendants and my blessing on your offspring, your children. They shall spring up like a green tamarisk, like willows by flowing streams. You see, water also represents life, and water is essential to life. Here, speaking through the prophet Isaiah, God compares the pouring out of water upon the dry land to the pouring out of his spirit upon the people. Just as the land flourishes and grows with water, so we flourish and grow through God's blessing, through God's spirit at work in our lives. Water and the pouring out of water reminds us of this beautiful analogy. One more scripture from Isaiah. Isaiah 55, 1 through 3. This is on page 685. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. Delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I will make you with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Now David, as you know, was a descendant of Abraham, a king in the Old Testament, and represents 
both the continuation of God's promise and also the partial fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham that kings would be descended from him. But what I love most about this passage is the wide invitation. Who may come to the waters? Everyone who thirsts, which is to say everyone who has a desire to be in connection with God and community. So regardless of your financial situation and regardless of whether you are one of Abraham's descendants or not, because of God's love for Abraham, because of God's love for David, because of God's love for his people and his creation, the covenant now is extended to everyone so that we might live and live fully. This promise that we first encountered all the way back in Genesis, I hope you see this, is changing, is evolving, fluid like water, growing more and more inclusive. And in the very next passage from Jeremiah, there is a recognition that what God is doing at this point in the story is something entirely new. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. It's on page 735. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. There's no water in this passage, but for the first time here, there is an acknowledgement that the covenant, the agreement between God and God's people is not or is no longer dependent upon our actions, upon our good behavior or our social status, or even upon our ability to live up to a myriad of laws and expectations and external factors. Now, the new covenant is not on the outside. It's on the inside. It's within our hearts. It is powerful and deeply personal. Although, there is still one familiar external sign to remind us of this new covenant. It's in Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27, on page 805. What is that external sign? I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. A new heart I will give you, and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove from your body the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and make you follow my statutes and be careful to observe my ordinances." Through the prophet Ezekiel, God acknowledges what most of us already know, and that is that we cannot possibly follow all of God's laws all on our own. We fall short every time. The only way we can do this is with God's help, with God's spirit poured out upon us and in us, cleansing us like water. I want you to do something for me. Whenever you take a shower, in the morning, in the evening, whenever. As the dirt and the sweat and the dead skin cells wash away down the drain, I want you to try this. I want you to remember that God does exactly the same thing for our hearts, for our spirits, washing away all of our mistakes, washing away all of our shortcomings and all of our failures. And then, God looks upon us with fresh eyes, seeing only what is pure and what is possible 
in the new day that lies ahead. How often does God forgive us and offer us a fresh start? Well, how often in the course of a lifetime do you shower? At least that many times. All right, to sum things up just a bit, by the time we get to the end of the Old Testament, and we pretty much have, four things are clear. One, God's Spirit has long been associated with water since the very beginning. Two, God's covenant and God's promises are associated with water. Three, water represents new life, blessing, fulfillment, and forgiveness. And four, all of these things are available to everyone. The pouring out of water upon a person, whether it's an infant or an adult, is more than just a ritual, although it is certainly, and at least that, and rituals have an important place in our lives and our culture. But more than a ritual, baptism and the pouring out of water is symbolic. It is a sign on the outside that points to something deeper, something on the inside. It's also a seal, a bond, something that connects us and ties us to God and to a community in a real and tangible, though mysterious, way. And so when we baptize someone, God is present in the water, just as he was on the first day of creation. God is present in the community, just as he was in ancient Israel through Abraham through David and the prophets. And God is present in the act of baptism in the covenant, the promises that we make, either for ourselves or on behalf of a child. In baptism, God is present. God is with us. And yet, lingering there at the very end of the Old Testament, there was still one more very important way in which God would soon choose to be present with us. He would send his son, Jesus, Emmanuel, which literally means God with us. He would send Jesus to be present on earth in the most tangible, physical, and human way possible. And then at the beginning of his ministry, at the beginning of his journey, Jesus himself would be baptized with water and the Spirit by his cousin John. And then at the end of his earthly life, Jesus would tell all of his followers to go into the world, making disciples and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that's exactly what they did. But that's next week's story. Let us pray. God, in the waters of creation, you moved, and you are still moving in the waters of our lives, in the river that is our faith journey that carries us one way and another, but yet guided and directed with a purpose. Lord, walk with us through the water and through the fire, through the challenges and the trials of our lives. Walk with us and sustain us and remind us that we are your people and you are our God, that we stand in a strong lineage, that we are loved and that we are forgiven. Help us to share that love and that forgiveness with everyone we encounter so that the promises we made or that were made on our behalf at our baptism become the kingdom that you talked about, the community of love and kindness and mercy that you want to see in this world. We pray all of these things just as you taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.